So I'm going to begin with a hypothetical scenario. Let's imagine that I have right before me a large and resonant drum, and I have a mallet that I can hit it with. And let's say I do hit my drum. So my question to everyone is, well, what do you hear? And it's not a trick question or anything. I think we all know from experience that you're just going to hear a single tone or note produced at a specific frequency. Um, and maybe some of us who are a little more knowledgeable may know that, in fact, you're not just hearing one tone, but there are actually multiple tones being produced by the drum, infinitely, at infinitely many discrete uh, frequencies. And these tones are known as overtones. Um, and if we take the set of frequencies of all these overtones, then what we have is known as the spectrum of our drum. OK, so that was an easy scenario. Let, let me, let's consider another hypothetical scenario. Let's say I still have my drum, and I still have my mallet. But this time, I blindfold you. And then I give you the superhuman power to be able to hear every single frequency produced by my drum. Now my question to you is, now that you can hear the whole spectrum of the sound that my drum makes, what can you tell me about what my drum looks like? Remember, you're blindfolded, so you can't see it. And so you may be thinking that this is kind of an outrageous question. How could one possibly hear a drum and then all of a sudden be able to construct from something audible a visual image of what my drum looks like? Well, fortunately for us, no question is too crazy for mathematicians. So in 1966, Mark Kotz presented to the mathematical community one of his, his most famous and, in my opinion, poetically phrased questions, can one hear the shape of a drum? So I'll be, very clear, I'll be clear what exactly he means by this question. So it's known that if we know exactly the shape of our drum, which we'll call omega, then we can determine exactly what frequencies are produced by our drum. So the question Kotz is asking is, well, if instead we, can, we know the exact distribution of frequencies, what can we know about the shape of our drum? And so Kotz's question is one of many unsolved questions in, this, uh, in, in the recent field in mathematics known as spectral theory, which, which studies drums and vibrations and all these frequencies. And uh, spectral theory actually played a very fundamental role in, descri in describing quantum mechanics and uh, had many implications in mathematics. But back to Kotz's question, it turns out the answer to Kotz's question in general is no. You can actually find lots of counterexamples of two drums that have the same spectrum but have uh, different geometries. An example was found by John Milner. He found that two 16-dimensional tori that had the exact same spectrum but had completely different shapes. But Kotz's question uh, is still unknown if we restrict our drum to specific types. So um, what we'll be considering is what if we consider drums that are convex, two-dimensional or planar, and have a smooth boundary. And this is kind of like what an actual drum would look like. Um, it turns out the answer to this question is still unknown in this domain. Um, one thing that is known is that the circle, for example, is uh, you can hear the shape of a circle if you re restrict our drum to this domain. So building off of that result, the question that we'll be asking is, can one hear the shape of an ellipse? And an ellipse it sort of serves as a natural generalization of our circle and is a very natural question to ask. So, so far, I've been speaking about this question completely in physical terms. So how exactly do we approach this mathematically? Well, what we use is this differential equation given here, known as the Helmholtz equation. And it uses this uh, um, gradient squared operator, or also known as Laplacian, operated on a function u that is sort of like a wave function for on our boundary. And um, these lambdas over here, these constant lambdas, um, only certain values of lambda will actually produce a solution for our uh, produce a solution u on our uh, drum omega. And these lambdas are known as eigenvalues. And now we should, we should all think of these eigenvalues analogous to actual frequencies in um, the actual reality. And um, like frequencies, if we take the set of all of these uh, eigenvalues, then what we have is uh, analogous to the spectrum in reality. And so now we can rephrase our question by Kotz as, is the shape of omega spectrally invariant. And by spectrally invariant, I mean determined by the spectrum. So now we have our problem well posed. So how exactly do we get there? So all it takes is really two easy steps. Um, the first step is we need to actually calculate what the eigenvalue spectrum is in the case of an ellipse. And then our second step is to determine if that spectrum is actually unique to the ellipse. So let's start with the first step, which is to calculate the eigenvalue spectrum. 
As it turns out, to calculate the spectrum directly from the Helmholtz equation is very difficult. And um, is, is very difficult to do even for simple cases like the circle. Um, but one of the most, uh, in my opinion, amazing results of the 20th century in mathematics was that it was actually, um, we can describe our eigenvalue spectrum in terms of this so-called length spectrum. There's a duality between them. So let me explain what I mean by a length spectrum. So first I need to define what a geodesic is. So let's pretend our drum is actually a pool table. And I take a billiard ball and I hit the ball off the boundary and it bounces like uh, how any ball would, according to the law of, um, law of reflection. And if we let our ball bounce around the boundary and then return to its original spot, then what we have is a closed geodesic. So the, a geodesic is the path that it travels. Closed geodesic just means it comes back to its original spot. And if we take the number of reflections in our closed geodesic, take it to infinity, and see the rate at which the length of this path approaches the perimeter of our drum, what we have is known as the length spectrum. And the non-trivial result that was derived in the 20th century is that somehow this eigenvalue spectrum, which is the solution or the, the solutions to this wave equation, is related to how these billiard ball bounces off this drum. This is pretty wild to think about. Um, but it turns out there's actually a physical intuition for why this is true. And it stems from the wave-particle duality from physics. So we can think of the eigenvalues sort of as waves because they correspond to frequencies. And then we can think of particles as the billiard ball itself kind of bouncing off. So it's not exactly, um, that's, that's not exactly how it works, but in a physical intuition sense, that's how we can think of it. So our question has now reduced, can we find the length spectrum of our uh, closed geodesic, which is a relatively simple problem. It's just a geometry problem. So how we do this is we first use this tool from plane geometry. It's a theorem that states that every closed geodesic that traverses an ellipse once always remains uh, tangent to a confocal ellipse. So confocal just means an ellipse with the same fo foci. So what do I mean? Let's say we just start out on some random point on our outer ellipse, and we just travel like a billiard ball. And the point is we always remain tangent to this inside ellipse. Um, and so why is this tool useful for us? Well, now we can characterize every closed geodesic on our ellipse by whatever inner ellipse that we choose. Um, in this case, we'll just, what well, physical property, we'll choose the eccentricity of our inner ellipse as a characterization parameter. And so with this coordinate change, we can actually calculate exactly, uh, with that theorem, we can actually calculate exactly where the points are on our ellipse in this closed geodesic. So how do we do that? Well, let's pretend our ellipse is actually a circle. And you imagine hitting your billiard ball off the circle, every, from bounce to bounce, the amount of arc length that you travel remains constant, right? Just because the circle is uh, symmetric like that. And unfortunately, if we use arc length, the same does not hold for the ellipse. Sometimes you travel more arc length, sometimes you travel less. But the idea is on the ellipse, we can actually construct a pseudo arc length coordinate, which we'll call u, such that when you do go from bounce to bounce, the coordinate u does increase by a constant each time. In this case, we'll label our constant ct, which is uh, dependent on the eccentricity t of our inner ellipse. And we can make u so that it's normalized onto 0 and 1. And the point is, if we set ct equal to 1 over n, then what we can do is figure out the exact uh, eccentricity that corresponds to a closed geodesic of length n. And so now we've been able to map out every single one of our points. And remember, our goal is to calculate the length spectrum. So we simply just take the length between every two adjacent bounces. And so now we have our main theorem. So if I could please have a drum roll. It's, uh, here's our main theorem, which is an explicit calculation for the length of our closed geodesic on our ellipse. Um, and so what we have here is ln, the length of our closed geodesic, is asymptotically equivalent to the length of our, uh, the perimeter of our ellipse plus this sum that has these coefficients ck that are some nasty expression. And the idea is that these ck's um, encode all the information in the length spectrum that we can get from the eigenvalue spectrum. So if we go back to what we originally wanted to do, we more or less finished our first step. Um, remember, we wanted to calculate the eigenvalue frequency uh, spectrum, but in effect, we did by calculating the length spectrum. So our next goal is to determine if the spectrum is actually unique to the ellipse, which turns out to be a much harder problem. Um, the first, first step has actually yet to be done yet. No one has actually written down the length spectrum. Um, and the second step is even harder. But we do have some hopes. These are these, there are these quantities uh, calculated by Marvisian Melrose, known as integral invariants, that we're able to prove that the circle is spectrally invariant. Um, and they can be calculated from our length spectrum. Um, and so our hope is that we can use these integral invariants like Marvisian Melrose 
um, calculate them from our length spectrum, and hopefully prove the spectral, uh, spectral invariance of the ellipse in a similar manner. So in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge my mentor, Ethan, who equipped me with all the tools necessary, mathematical tools, in order to tackle this problem. I uh, thank Professor Richard Melrose of MIT, who actually proposed the problem. Dr. Slava Garevich, Professor Moitra, Professor Jerison for overseeing the RSI mathematics program. Dr. Tanya Kovanova for her weekly input. My tutor, Dr. John Rickard, for um, his invaluable advice on writing and presenting. All of my sponsors who made this possible, and the Center of Excellence in Education for the opportunity to, uh, to do this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caleb. So, questions from the judges? I may have missed the conclusion about how an elliptical drum should sound. Is, that, is there a conclusion about that? Um, right. So our conclusion is uh, we don't know yet. Okay. Um, so we got, we, we got one step done, which was um, uh, hard enough. But um, hopefully going, going ahead, we can be able to use this tool given to us by Marvizi and Melrose to actually determine whether, we, whether this uh, spectrum of an ellipse is unique to itself. So it would sound different than a drum that's round. Uh, we think probably uh, that's the that's what people believe is that in this domain the answer to uh, Katz's question is actually true, but um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to prove. So the duality that you talked about between uh, the eigenvalue spectrum and the length spectrum, uh, for what shapes does it hold? Is it only for uh, for yeah. convex smooth shapes yeah. or more generally? So um, the thing is. Um, this length spectrum depends on the definition of a geodesic, right? And uh, the closed geodesic is only well-defined if, well, you need your boundary to be smooth, right? Otherwise, you can't always reflect. Um, and you need um, it to be convex in order to return. You can imagine if it's not convex, sometimes it won't return back. And so, yeah, uh, to answer your question, yes, is this is only in the case of this convex planar domain, which is why it's um, uh, s such a focus of study um, for Katz's question, because we can tackle it using this uh, this tool, the closed geodesic. Thank you very much. It's a very elegant and exciting um, story. Mm -hmm. I have a very uh, uh, rude and inappropriate question. This learning, which is beautiful learning for, from a mathematical standpoint, can we somehow use it in industry for understanding what's wrong with my part? better. Uh, I, so, I understand, I understand yeah, yeah. For that for pure mathematicians. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a stupid question. Yeah. But what I'm getting at, this is something that I learned about eigenvalues uh, yeah. and their relation to some geometry, right. uh, some dualities, some nice things. Can I, as I say, uh, say I want to understand what happens mm -hmm. inside my part, which right. changes the spectrum, I, uh, the spectrum, or I want to understand what happened with the shape of my part. Right. Um, Is there anything I can use from that? Right. Um, I personally don't know of anyone um, listening to drums and seeing what they can tell about no, it. No, 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 sir. I personally know that we are listening to parts. Uh, right. pe pe people I'm working with are listening to parts. Mm -hmm. They agitate uh, sound waves, and from the response, they understand what's right on, or what's wrong. Right. Uh, in ancient times, people were listening to air engines, uh, you know, car engines, yeah. uh, and using some kind of diagnostics like that. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to get from myself, from what we learned from your work, right. can we have some advancement? And it's an open-ended question. Mm -hmm. Can we have some advancement in that di diagnostic methods? Um. I understand I'm putting yeah. you on the spot. I understand yeah. that mathematicians normally won't. Uh, but my feeling, some kind of intuition, says that we can use some of that learning. Yeah. That's why I'm putting that in your complication, in that complicated position. Yeah. Um, well, well, my results, how they would be able to advance this question. Is that your question, in essence? My question is how your results yeah. and all this duality and all background information yeah. can advance potentially. I'm not asking how. Right. 
Do you think they can advance the diagnostics and learning that we get from the spectrum that we measure? Right. Come um, back, uh, response, acoustic response of some kind of, not necessarily drum, but right. Andrew Wayne, whatever. Um, uh, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't know exactly how in industry one would be able to use this, but the significance of my result is that we actually calculated the explicit length spectrum, which remember is more or less the eigenvalue spectrum from um, in, in this case. And so um, this is something that has rarely been done. I, I don't field. want to dismiss significance mm -hmm. of your results. I'm very excited. Yeah. And that is the reason I'm trying to take advantage of that. Yeah. Don't take me wrong. Uh -huh. I am yeah. not mm -hmm. saying, I am not saying, uh, I appreciate the result mm. from the little that I know it's a very, very bright and elegant result. Now I'm getting greedy. Just uh, maybe you might think about that later. It's yeah. an open-ended question. Sorry for dist dis distracting you oh, no, from no, the main <laughs> thing. I um, was just saying that it's yeah. a great and elegant mm -hmm. theory. Maybe it has some unexpected uh, applications. Right, yeah. Thanks. Do we have any final questions for judges? Adam. So I guess the, um, the question you're asking is, um, is a sort of an existential question. Do there exist two different shapes with the same, yes. um, w with the same spectrum? Uh, you could also uh, ask about the computational feasibility of reconstructing a shape given the spectrum. Um, is, is there any work on that? Do, do you know what? Uh, so so the question is, um, what do we know that we can do computationally to reconstruct our shape from the spectrum? Yes. Um, uh, I do know that I did read in the literature some engineering papers that um, we're trying to do that in like, yeah, some, uh, taking the special case of the circle and just taking those eigenvalues, which we can write out explicitly, but are, are very nasty to write out, um, and then somehow try, try to reconstruct. But in general, I think, um, I, I'm not sure of any general way to do that. Yeah. Fortunately, we're out of time. Thanks again.